Text of Study by V. T. Hotef, Sabbath, October 19, 1946, Mount Carmel Chapel, Waco, Texas. I shall read from the Mount of Blessings, page 161, beginning with the first paragraph. The will of God is expressed in the precepts of His holy law, and the principles of this law are the principles of heaven. The angels of heaven attain to no higher knowledge than to know the will of God, and to do His will is the highest service that engage their powers. But in heaven, service is not rendered in the spirit of legality. When Satan rebelled against the law of Jehovah, the thought that there was a law came to the angels almost as an awakening to something unthought of. In their ministry, the angels are not as servants, but as sons. There is perfect unity between them and their Creator. Obedience is to them no drudgery. Love for God makes their service a joy. So in every soul wherein Christ, the hope of glory, dwells, his words are re-echoed. I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, the law is within my heart. The petition, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, is a prayer that the reign of evil on this earth may be ended, that sin may be forever destroyed, and that the kingdom of righteousness be established. Then the earth as it is in heaven will be fulfilled all the good pleasures of his goodness. Now, what shall we pray for? We should pray that the law of God be written in our hearts, that we obey the law because we want to, not because we have to, that we realize that our keeping His commandments is for our own good, that our highest joy be in doing His will. Thus may God's will be done on earth as it is done in heaven. Who will lead in prayer from the section on my right to the chapel, on my right of the chapel? And who will follow from the section on my left of the chapel? I shall close. Let us kneel. Subject, Zechariah 1. In our last Sabbath study, we learned that the prophecy of Zechariah is applicable to two peoples at two different times. First, to the Jews while returning from Babylon to Jerusalem, and second, to those who in the time of the end are to come out of all nations. We also learned that re the revival and reformation which took place then is a forecast of a revival and reformation that is to take place in our time, and that the peoples returning then from Babylon is a type of the peoples returning now from all the world. We shall turn to Zechariah chapter 1, verses 1 to 6. In the eighth month, in the second year of Darius, came the word of the Lord unto Zechariah. Here we see that the prophet Zechariah was called to his prophetic office in the second year of Darius the king. Why was he called in that particular year? For the answer, we shall turn to Ezra 4, verses 20, verse 24. Then ceased the work of the house of God, which is at Jerusalem. So it ceased unto the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. Obviously, Zechariah was then called because the work of the temple at Jerusalem had stopped. Before the work was resumed, however, the Lord sent a message of rebuke to the builders. We find it in Zechariah 1, verses 2 to 6. The Lord hath been sore displeased with your fathers. Therefore, say thou unto them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Turn ye unto me, saith the Lord of hosts. Be not as your fathers, unto whom the former prophets have cried, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Turn ye now from your evil ways, and from your evil doings. But they did not hear, nor hearken unto me, saith the Lord. Your fathers, where are they? And the prophets, do they live forever? But my words and my statutes, which I command my servants, the prophets, did they not take hold of your fathers? And they returned and said, Like as the Lord of hosts thought to do unto us, according to our ways and according to our doings, 
so hath he dealt with us. The builders were first reminded that they were in Babylon because their fathers had not obeyed the word of the Lord that came to them through his prophets. Also, for this same reason, the temple and the kingdom were destroyed. The builders were plainly told that if their project was ever to pr prosper, they would have to avoid the course pursued by their fathers, and they must also give special heed to the prophets, Zechariah and Haggai. The builders then promised that they would not walk in the ways of their fathers. It was in the eighth month that Zechariah delivered to them this reformatory message. The Jews' hearty acceptance of this message prepared the way for another, and within the space of three months it came. Now let us read verses 7 and 8. Upon the four and twentieth day of the eleventh month, which is the month Sabbat, in the second year of Darius, came the word of the Lord unto Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Ido the prophet, saying, I saw by night, and behold, a man riding upon a red horse. And he stood among the myrtle trees that were in the bottom, and behind him were there red horses, speckled and wet. For the interpretation of this symbolism, we shall read the angel's explanation in verses 9 and 10. Then said I, O Lord, what are these? And the angel that talked with me said unto me, I will show thee what these be. And the man that stood among the myrtle trees answered and said, These are they whom the Lord hath sent to walk to and fro through the earth. Since the Lord sent the horses to walk to and fro through the earth, they of course must be symbolical of the Lord's messengers, those whom he sends to the nations. The red, speckled, and white horses represent several types of horses, and thus they symbolize a group of messengers from various races and nationalities. The horses, therefore, do not symbolize the Hebrews of Zechariah's day, nor those in Christ's day. Verse 11. And they answered the angel of the Lord that stood among the myrtle trees, and said, We have walked to and fro through the earth, and behold, all the earth sitteth still, and is at rest. The fact that the horses answered the angel proves that they were a kind that could speak. Now, since they could speak, and since the Lord sent them to walk to and fro through the earth, we positively know that they were symbolical of ministers, messengers whom God has appointed. Their being sent to walk to and fro through the earth signifies their being sent to the nations. Moreover, their answer, we have walked to and fro through the earth, reveals that they had fulfilled their mission, and their report that the earth was at rest and sitting still reveals that the nations were not much affected by their message. Now, since we know that in Zechariah's day, the messages, the messengers of God were Jews, and moreover, since they were sent to the Jewish nation only, Zechariah's prophecy must be applied to the latter days, in the days he appoints messengers of various nationalities to whom he sends and whom he sends to the nations. All these positive identifications clearly point to the first day Adventists, the only people who fulfilled this symbolic prophecy. Between the years 1833 to 1844, they zealously preached the second advent of Christ, and having on their own initiative interpreted the cleansing of the sanctuary to be the cleansing of the earth in 1844 AD, as the set date approached, they returned from their mission and of, pro of proclaiming the second advent of Christ with the full confidence that they had gone to and fro through the earth, and that there was time no longer. Concerning the scope of their work, the Great Controversy, page 368, has this to say. The writings of Miller and his associates were carried to distant lands, wherever missionaries had penetrated in all the world, were sent the glad tidings of Christ's speedy return, Far and wide spread the message of the everlasting gospel. Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. Now, verses 11 and 12. And, the, and they answered the angel of the Lord that stood among the myrtle trees and said, We have walked to and fro through the earth, 
and behold, all the earth stood still and is at rest. Yes, the messengers thought their work was finished, but the angel, who really knew the facts, saw God's people still in captivity, still away from their homeland, while the heathen were at ease. You remember that the prophet Jeremiah predicted the seventy years captivity of the Jews in Babylon. But since we know that the prophet Zechariah was intermingling two movements in his prophecy, one to take place in his time and one in our time, the captivity of one movement therefore is typical of the captivity of the other. In other words, just as the, just as the Jews were still in captivity in Zechariah's day, so God's people were still in captivity in the year 1844. Thus, while the angel on the one hand was referring to the 70 years of Jeremiah's prophecy, Jeremiah 25, verse 11 and 12, and on the other hand, contesting the answer which the horses gave, he was more directly referring to the prevailing conditions in 1844. So the angel pleaded that the Lord was to do something about it, as we shall see by reading verses 13 and 14. And the Lord answered the angel that talked with good words and comfortable words. So the angel that communed with me said unto me, Cry thou, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I am jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion with a great jealousy. The Lord did not answer angrily, as he would have at the time of the Jewish dispersion, and rather than saying, Zion shall be plowed as a field, and Jerusalem shall become heaps, Micah 3.12, he expresses great jealousy for them, and commands his servants thus, cry, preach. Verses 16 and 17. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, I am returned to Jerusalem with mercies. My house shall be built in it, saith the Lord of hosts, and lines shall be stretched forth. Uh, upon Jerusalem, cry yet, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, My cities, through prosperity, shall yet be spread abroad, and the Lord shall yet comfort Zion, and shall yet choose Jerusalem. The Lord here gave the assurance that he had returned to Jerusalem with mercies, not with wrath. And he also positively declared that his house would be built, and a line would yet stretch forth, would be yet stretched forth upon Jerusalem. Then he commanded, Cry yet, meaning declare again. The Lord shall yet comfort Zion, and shall yet choose Jerusalem. Thus it was that just as soon as the set date of 1844 passed, the Lord commissioned his people to cry yet, and to set as their goal the gathering of the 144,000 converts, the first fruits, a guileless company, those who were to stand on Mount Zion with the Lamb, the comfort of Zion and Jerusalem. Moreover, all the books of the Bible meet and end in the Revelation. So the same incident is found in Revelation 10. That is, as soon as the disappointed ones in 1844 came, which is represented by the little books turning bitter, after having been eaten, the angel declared, Thou must prophesy again before many people, peoples and nations and tongues and kings, Revelation 10.10 10, and also 11. So it was that to carry out this mission, the, se the Second Advent Movement was reorganized and named Seventh-day Adventists. Thus the Lord charged his messengers to cry yet, to proclaim again, to continue to preach. As to the means that will make it possible for the Lord's people to return to their own land, we shall read verses 18 and 19. Then lifted I up mine eyes, and saw, and behold, four horns. And I said unto the angel that talked with me, What be these? And he answered me, these are the four horns which have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. The kingdom of Judah occupied the southern portion of the promised land, and the kingdom of Israel occupied the northern portion. The former kingdom was scattered by the kings of Babylon, 
and the latter kingdom by the kings of Assyria. Those who returned to Jerusalem in the days of Zechariah were from the kingdom of Judah, but the kingdom of Israel was assimilated by the nations and consequently lost its identity. The ancient powers who scattered Judah and Israel were symbolized by the four horns. Now, verses 20 and 21. And the Lord shewed me four carpenters. Then said I, What came, what come these to do? And he spake, saying, These are the horns which have scattered Judah, so that no man did lift up his head. But these are come to fray them, to cast out the horns of the Gentiles, which lifted up their horns, their horn over the land of Judah to scatter it. To scatter it. Here the same powers which scattered Judah and Israel are again seen not as horns, but as carpenters, not to scatter God's people, but to build for them, to cast out the horns, powers, of the Gentiles, those who now rule the land. Plainly, then, nations which do not now rule Palestine are to arise as horns against the rulers and inhabitants of Palestine. Thus will the time of the Gentiles end. Thus will the time of the Gentiles end. God's people will then return to their homeland. The antitypical temple will be built, and the cities will be spread abroad. I need not read to you from history to prove that our fathers have failed as did the fathers of the Jews, for you already know for you already know it. You are familiar with what Testimonies for the Church, Volume 3, page 253, and Volume 5, page 217 say, that the Church is in a sad deception and does not know it, is a mystery no longer. The Jews went blind because they closed their ears to the prophets and took no heed to what they said. To what they said. The Church today boastingly says, I have need of nothing. She openly declares that she expects no prophets. She thus has fallen even lower than the Jews. The book of Zechariah in its entirety has always been a closed book, but now it is given up to us its deep spiritual meaning. And for one to work against its fresh, clear revelation of truth, is as bad, yes, perhaps worse, than the Jews killing the former prophets. We now clearly see that though our fathers, our former prophets, are dead, yet God's word lives forever. Man may slay the messengers of God, but they cannot destroy his word. It is indeed like a mustard seed. Though it be cast into the ground, so that it can no more be searched out, then can a mustard seed, still it springs up and, bear, and bears fruit. Men, however, even yet are blind to this never-failing fact. For example, when the message began to come, some tried desperately to kill it, yet it lives on. Now they are making another attempt, but how foolish! They were unable to thwart the work when it was as small and as weak as a mustard seed. So how can they accomplish their purpose now, since our God-given work has grown and borne fruits? This they cannot see even though the fact stands out in bold relief. I am not worried about the possibility of anyone's hurting the work of God, neither am I worried about how I will get to Palestine. But I am worried as to whether I will be ready to start out. That ought to be your worry. Yes, everyone's worry.